Please welcome the director of DARPA's Tactical Technology Office, Dr. Fred Kennedy. I'm going to talk to you today about disruption. Disruption of enterprises, disruption of architectures, disruption of bureaucracies, but most of all, disruption of culture. I want to talk about disruption in relation to DARPA's mission, which is to create or prevent technological surprise. We create technological surprise for our adversaries, but we prevent it for ourselves. DARPA was born out of Sputnik in 1957, and frankly, Sputnik scared us. We realized we'd been caught flat-footed, and we knew we had to change. The United States resolved not to ever again allow an adversary to leapfrog us technologically. So what did we do? We stood up NASA. We stood up the National Reconnaissance Office. We built the Saturn F1 engine, the Global Positioning System, stealth platforms, J-STARS, Predator and Global Hawk drones, the Pegasus launch vehicle, and many other systems that our warfighters depend upon today. That legacy of innovation and brilliance has bought us decades of dominance, but now it's time we take stock. Our systems are very, very capable, but they're exquisite and they're expensive. They require decades and billions of dollars to develop, field, and sustain. And this poses a problem. So let's talk about that problem for a minute. I'll illustrate with just a few examples. The F-35 multi-role fighter. Development of the F-35 began in 1992. First flight occurred in December of 2006, and the Marine Corps only declared its first squadron ready to deploy on 31 July 2015. Now that's 23 years between the start of a development program and the first deployment of aircraft to a combat squadron. How about space? Well, let's take the space-based infrared system, or SIBRS, something I'm familiar with. It's a follow-on to a very successful and long-running ballistic missile early warning effort, the Defense Support Program. Requirements development for SIBRS began back in 1994, right after the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. The first SIBRS geosynchronous spacecraft was not launched until 2011, and the objective constellation, which means all of the satellites in the architecture, weren't fully populated until earlier this year in January of 2018. That's 24 years. Finally, let's take an example from the maritime domain. The USS Gerald R. Ford, the lead ship in its class of new aircraft carriers. Congress provided advanced procurement funding back in 2001. Northrop Grumman began advanced construction around 2005 in the only shipyard that the US has that can actually build a large deck nuclear powered carrier. The Ford was formally commissioned in July of 2017 after spending an estimated $12.9 billion to acquire. And that's not counting the roughly $5 billion in research and development funding that preceded that build phase. The Ford is now undergoing sea trials, but won't deploy until 2020. So that's about 19 years. So what's my point? Well, the beauty of exquisite, expensive, lengthy development cycles is that they come with pathological risk aversion for free kind of like a side of fries. You didn't order it, but you're going to get it, and you're probably going to eat it. <laughs> now, I can tell you, too big to fail was a DOD term of art long before Goldman Sachs. When you build force structure this way, it allows potential adversaries ample time to analyze that structure, our orders of battle, our tactics, techniques, and procedures, and devise countermeasures for all of them before you've even fielded your system. Worse, it allows our adversaries to proliferate these countermeasures to other nations. Now, these countermeasures include emerging capabilities such as hypersonic weapons. Recent Russian and Chinese advances have shown that the lesson has not been lost on other nations' militaries and leadership. Hypersonic weapons are fast. They compress decision loops, they stress our defensive systems, and they make it very difficult for us to respond to attacks. Integrated air defense systems. Other nations have deployed multiple generations, increasingly capable generations of these networks since we started thinking about the F-35 way back in the 1990s. Counterspace. 
Potential adversaries recognize our dependence on space systems, and they are building counters to every element of our existing architecture. Now, that means our adversaries understand the weaknesses of our system, and they've worked out the means to effectively exploit it and negate our advantages, and that's across domains. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to get back inside our adversaries' decision loops at the tactical, strategic, and frankly, the grand strategic levels. So how do we do this? Well, through disruption. We must disrupt our enterprises and our cultures in order to disrupt the enemy's calculus. Disruption is not just a buzzword. It's a DARPA's, it's DARPA's core mission, it's our forte. Disruption is controlled chaos. It's initiated by us. It's intended to put us on new paths that our adversaries could never have predicted. And it is difficult, especially for our military cultures, which always, don't always respond well to huge change. But respond, we must. So what does disruption look like? Let's take a brief look at our physical domains. And we'll take the air first. 40 years of doubling down on the miracle of stealth. DARPA's Hab Blue stealth aircraft first flew back in 1977. We are about to embark on our sixth generation of advanced tactical fighter. Yet our adversaries have had quite a long time, four decades, to figure out how best to counter these stealthy systems. So what could we do now to turn the table and make the significant adversary investment in air defense systems totally obsolete? Well, one thought, why not adopt a new objective in the air domain? Replace air dominance, which is profoundly expensive, with something I'd like to refer to as undeterrable air presence. And that means simply, you may see us coming, and you may shoot at us, but you won't hit anything. Hypersonics may be one of several avenues to achieving undeterrable air presence. Hypersonic, hypersonic weapons speed and survivability make them incredibly difficult to defeat even if they're detected and tracked. In the ground domain, we have to break the symmetry of ground combat. In no other physical domain do we retain as marginal an advantage over our enemy. Now, one way to recover the asymmetry we need involves inserting autonomous sensors and other units to act as a buffer between our troops and opposing forces. Our URSA program, which is short for Urban Reconnaissance through Supervised Autonomy, is investigating ways for teams of autonomous agents, both in the air and on the ground, to detect and catalog threats to our forces before they ever engage. Finally, in the space domain. Much like the maritime domain, space is characterized by small numbers of exquisite, high-value assets. Now, most of these systems were conceived and constructed when space was still considered a sanctuary, and threats appeared to be unlikely to be fielded in quantity. This is no longer the case. We no longer have the luxury of perfecting our space systems prior to launch. We can no longer expect them not to be targeted. They will be. But the good news, we don't have to start from scratch. There's an entire community of private sector, new space firms that are racing ahead to build out tremendous capability on orbit. All we need to do is figure out how to ride that wave. Now, that wave is going to give us, among other things, a revolutionary comms infrastructure in low Earth orbit. This is Blackjack, a space-based internet enabled by hundreds to thousands of inexpensive small satellites with optical links, enabling near instantaneous communications between any two points on the planet. Low latency, ubiquitous communications makes this architecture resilient. Thousands of satellites versus just a handful of high value assets. Our adversaries will be faced with a dauntingly different problem set. Now, that means cost imposition on them, not us, and on a huge scale. Now, that's deterrence, because we don't want to fight that space war. We want to deter it. Such an architecture will be significantly more responsive to emerging threats. On both tactical timelines, because we'll be able to push perishable data directly to shooters, and on acquisition timelines, because now we can leverage commercial production methods to build new systems on short order at low cost. Rapid tech refresh will bring back what we've really been lacking in the space community, innovation. If you can afford to lose a satellite, and it's easy and cheap to make a new one, 
incentives for risk aversion will go away. And now you can build faster, and you can build more, and you can invent and decide whether or not you've got good stuff and can keep moving. That's Moore's Law to Space. This, this is going to be hard. It, but it's something we can do, and with our commercial partners and others, only if we're willing to discard old, comfortable ways of doing business. So, in a nutshell, that's enterprise disruption. It's about getting back to the core tenet of DARPA, surprising your adversary by reinventing yourself. And now I'd like to call to the stage a man that I've followed and admired for many years, one of our nation's greatest military minds with 40 years of active, almost 40 years of active duty service, retired Marine General James Haas Cartwright. He's a former commander of the United States Strategic Command, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and someone who deeply understands the purpose and value of DARPA to shape the vital conversations we have about where we go in the future and how we get there. I've asked him to join me here today to provide his perspective on the power of disruption, how looking at problems from new angles can afford the warfighter with new capability, and we'll discuss the implications for how we're going to fight in the future in each of the physical domains. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome General Cartwright. <laughs> Sir, good to have you here. Thank you. So what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to have a dialogue here for the next 40 or so minutes on how disruption will impact our physical domains of warfare. Uh, and I'd like to start by saying uh, we'll work through each of them. You can see them on the chart. At least I can see them on my charts. Um, there you go. That's perfect. We will walk through space first. And we may spend a little more time on space to start, <laughs> just because there's a, there's a lot of interest in it right now. Uh, and so we'll try to go into some of that, including some of the organizational issues that are out there. At that, we'll also transition at that point to maritime, which has uh, features which are very similar to space. And then we'll go to ground and air. So sir, what I thought we'd do is uh, I'll just start by asking you, what do you think of uh, disruption as a, uh, as a construct for how we move forward, uh, especially in the space domain, given the fact that we have large, exquisite systems that we typically take a long time to build in the field? So. Uh, one, thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Um, no with a couple of your friends here, but, um, you know, the disruption side um, is something uh, in space that has given us a, a card that, um, you know, has, has done, done great things for us. Probably the largest transition that we've gone through is the realization right now um, that while space is still the high ground, it's no longer a sanctuary. And you, you may mentioned that in your remarks. And so uh, this discussion that we're having about space force and how do we organize for space and do we have the right incentive structure to ensure that the nation maintains both the opportunity and the capability to capitalize um, on what that domain brings uh, to, to our national security. Um, you know, that conversation will be heavily laden with culture, cultural biases, technological biases, domain biases, et cetera, all of which will be the reason not to do anything. Mm -hmm. And um, the question then becomes, how do you proceed? How do you break the ice in this? Um, uh, hopefully, we don't have to go the way that Billy Mitchell had to go. Um, Court but, Marshall. <laughs> but it's going to take you know, um, some very committed leadership to move, it, move out in this domain and maintain the opportunities that we have. And you say, um, what kind of problem are we really trying to solve here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, can't we just get along and, and incrementally improve on what we have? Um, and the good news, I mean, whether it's the Sputnik moment in DARPA, but um, certainly in my time, starting back with um, uh, Tony Tether's leadership in this area, um, we have done a lot of work in trying to understand um, the opportunities of disaggregation of the, of the, um, the organizational and, and operational platform construct that we follow in space, looking at servicing on, on orbit, looking at moving, moving from orbit to orbit or maneuvering in space instead of just pure orbital mechanics, things like that that would give us opportunity. We've done all of that work you know, inside of DARPA. But now we are really in a, in a time where, um, number one, uh, 
everything that we are looking at um, in um, whether you call it the offset strategy or, or just how we're going to move forward here to maintain and disrupt the institution such that we can impose cost on our adversaries um, in ways that um, will, will deter bad actors. Um, if we're going to do AI, if we're going to do swarm, if we're going to um, work in the hypersonic area, um, space is absolutely essential to all of those things. Um, and organizing ourselves uh, principally to understand the opportunities there and, and to take advantage of them and to build an incentive structure around a tactical, operational, and strategic space, um, we're going to have to probably start to move in a direction that is different than where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the dialogue is clouded, certainly. For me, the train and equip side of this equation, you know, the two legal and logical organizational constructs that come first is um, something like the Marine Corps, but a corps that is attached to a service so you're not buying all of the infrastructure and, and overhead. And then if there is um, still a, um, a shortfall um, once we get into that area, then a standalone service. Now, you can skip over the first step if you think that's important. You know, that's important enough, but those are the steps. I think for space, it's when, not if, mm -hmm. but, but a measured movement in that direction to understand the implications and, and what it is you're doing. Um, and, and clearly a joined um, vision of where you want to end up with the Congress. Um, you, so you maintain the legal and financial basis. None of that is on the operational side. Mm -hmm. uh, the operational side, um, the, the thing that you start with is a war fighting organization, a, a, which people will immediately go to a combatant command. Uh, my worry about that is that that was essentially the path we followed for cyber. Mm -hmm. and, and the bias that that puts in is that it makes it a strategic mindset immediately, and you lose the tactical and operational applications of, of the domain um, uh, in doing that. And, and so, uh, and the whole bottom is, of whatever do. force you have. Yeah, you got to build the bottom. You got to build the tactical side of this equation. What am I going to do tactically? What am I going to do operationally before I move to the strategic side of the equation? Mm -hmm. But but those would be the the steps. Those are the imperatives I see there. Um, you know, we can talk about the other domains, and I think it's going to be important to talk about maritime and, and ground and air and what space will do for those. But but space right now is certainly not unlike in the maritime domain, the transition from the seascape to the land. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we're going to transition from space to air. And that's going to be hard. I mean, technically hard, operationally hard, culturally hard. The hardest part will be cultural. You mentioned the, the problem that we're trying to solve, and, and that's an interesting one in this context. Um, I feel like if, if we get after the right problem here, and if the problem is the one we've been talking about, which is we're sort of out of the adversary decision loop, people are moving faster than us, uh, if a space force or a space core or whatever organizational construct we end up with, if it addresses that, that key issue, and gets us back inside the turning radius of an adversary with the right architectures, I feel like we're going in the right direction then. Um, I also, I'm also concerned about the architecture we go after because I could see a I can see us pulling towards a, let's protect what we've got, which has some maritime flavor to it. How do I protect the carrier? In this case, how do I protect all my assets? As opposed to trying to shift the playing field to something new and different, which I think throws the adversary off and makes them have to retool, and that's where the cost of position comes. Yeah, I think it's absolutely essential to have an operational construct in your mind mm -hmm. of where you want to end up and what problems you're trying to take on in technology what problems you're trying to take on, but what is the problem, operational problem you're trying to solve out there? So, so if you look at the um, landscape as it sits today, certainly it's hard to find an ally that wants 100,000 Americans based in their country in order to protect somebody else's neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the kind of the, the playbook on Monday is, okay, I've watched what America does, so what I really need to do is, in 24 or 48 hours, is rush, take the land, and apologize, but keep it. Mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> and, and America can't get there in time to do anything about it. 
Okay? Or the best they can do is put a speed bump in my way, but not, an, not a real credible force to stop me. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's using islands or whether it's using you know, um, land masses and, and the ability just to move on your neighbor, um, we have to find a way to credibly, one, deter that activity and have the ability to stop it if necessary. Without the forward basing that we've been used to. Mm -hmm. Certainly, at least in that forward basing construct, it will not be of the scale mm -hmm. that we've you know, had in the past. And so how do you start to think about that? And then how do you mass the fires? Mm -hmm. And how do you support the fires over a, uh, an extended period of time? Um, and, and how do you get to, whether it's hypersonic or, or, or greater speeds, to allow that to occur? Mm -hmm. Um, what, are the, what are the things that you need operationally? What does it look like on, to the tactical soldier on the ground? Um, and how do you start to support those? Um, and, and that architecture right now is starting to be looked at, and, and hypersonics is the first step in that direction. Um, but hypersonics in the thick atmosphere is interesting, but operationally can't really have the reach that you need, et cetera. You have to transit space to do it you know, in any mindset. And those transitions are hard. The thermal technologies are really hard, but it, it is a game changer. And um, if, that, if that becomes an element of our strategy, um, which I think it has to, now you start to have a different game. And now you have problems that you're actually trying to solve here, operational problems, um, with meaningful solutions um, that um, will impose huge cost on anybody who would like to chase us. Absolutely. Well, it's clear that hypersonics are going to afford us that capability in terms of closing decision loops tactically, there's no doubt. Um, and it occurs to me that this is a great place for space to play because the targeting of these systems is going to have to come from somewhere overhead. Mm -hmm. It would be very difficult to do that uh, natively. So I think there's a lot, a lot of synergy between the near space regime where hypersonics will play air and space. This is, this is true cross-domain. So. <laughs> I think where DARPA really needs to be thinking in this area, um, when you look at the AI side of this equation, DARPA's already working the, the thermal side of it. but what are the metrics for data processing power in swarm and, and, and for um, hypersonic m movement? In other words, how do I keep that projectile smart um, to end game? Um, these are areas that, um, for which there are no metrics right now. And it's, it's an area that, that DARPA is going to have to take on. We've been struggling with that quite a bit. We've been looking at, uh, at how to produce you know, reasonable metrics for artificial intelligence and autonomy to apply to all of these problem sets. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking about blackjack as an opportunity to, to look at the use of artificial intelligence to dramatically close uh, kill chains and decision loops. To do that, you're not going to be able to have folks on the loop. It's just not going to be feasible. All that processing is going to have to occur very rapidly. Targets will have to be selected and that information will have to be handed off to shooters to make a determination about what to do with it. But no, we're, we're deep into the autonomy problem, but I'm not sure we have all the smarts we need yet to go do it. Uh, I, I think that's probably true. I, I mean, the stark contrast I, I draw is that um, our most sophisticated surface combatants are in kind of the dial-up modem speed. Mm -hmm. If I go to the Disney Cruise Line, I can get m multiple gigabits. <laughs> you know, I just... We're, we are not um, architected, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of work going on this. I'm not throwing stones here, sure. but, but we have a substantial amount of work to do, but we don't have metrics against which we're trying to think about this. If you want to have a, a swarm of 100 or 1,000 of surface or water or air type vehicles. You're going to have to move that data. I mean, yeah. you know, 5G is not going to be enough. No. I think, I think commercial is going to help us there, though. I really do. I think that's, that's we have to find a partnership uh, mm -hmm. there. And space, I think, is one of the areas where um, we have invested in, in disrupting this activity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that disruption is paying dividends. We now need to figure out how to mature that relationship and partnership 
because access to space, um, one of the key metrics uh, of being able to do that is going to be reusability. There's just no way around it. And we've chased that for quite a while, and now it's becoming real. Um, and the cost um, benefit of having reusability um, in that chain, uh, in that architecture, is hugely leveraging. It's hard to see how you get to aircraft-like operations without it. Yeah. Um, if you're going to do these things quickly, if you're going to turn launch systems on a dime, if you're going to look anything like the way we do aircraft today, which I think you're going to have to do to be effective. Yeah. I think um, you have uh, Gwen coming in, Shotwell coming in. We do tonight. SpaceX, but you know, if, if with Falcon 9, mm -hmm. you can get 10 reuses and then eventually 100, that's a turn cycle that's faster than a bomber. Right. <clears throat> and that will be culturally very difficult to manage. But also difficult to avoid. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, It'll change you know. the incentive structure. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's <clears throat> why, I mean, Mach 5 to Mach 10 is interesting. Mach 20 is far above is where you want to be. I think you're right. You know, we're, we're tackling this with a, uh, with a couple of things. We've got our experimental space plane effort that we're doing with Boeing as a, as a commercial partnership. Um, and we're looking to see if we can fly that vehicle 10 times in 10 days. Uh, that's going to be a, a, that's a tough road to go home. Uh, the other one is we're talking up something called the Launch Challenge, where we're trying to figure out at the low end, a few hundred kilos uh, payload class, can we very quickly uh, call up capability, ask a, a vendor with a launch vehicle to show up on a site of our choosing, tell them of the ephemeris of the orbit we want to go to, and here's the package, you've got 72 hours to figure that out, go, go launch it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to do that with, uh, with the small launcher community here at the end of 2019. I think that's essential. Uh, if we're going to try to actually have the kind of proliferated swarm capabilities on orbit we think we need, yeah. if we can't figure out how to put them up quickly, cheaply, um, you won't change the culture. Uh, you'll just you'll just make small satellites hard. Yeah. And that doesn't make any sense, so. Um, I, you know, my, my sense here, too, is that um, DARPA kind of operates on a pendulum from the standpoint of working down technical risk all the way to working down manufacturing risk. And right <clears> now, <throat> in a partnership, particularly in the space side of the equation, we really want to be more on the technical risk side of this rather than the manufacturing. You have multiple entries into the field out there um, that are handling the manufacturing risk. Now we've got to figure out how we're going to work with them. Mm -hmm. So if it's to build a delivery vehicle that carries a payload to space, takes that payload to a place, you know, in the middle of who knows where, but center of Pacific, right. and drops it off, and it re-enters, and it has 15, 20,000 miles of driving speed and time. Um, that's an interesting capability. That's an interesting <laughs> capability. Okay, the truck that takes it up there has to be reusable. Mm -hmm. The truck that deploy takes it to the point of deployment has to be reusable. Um, and then the aerodynamics and the and the thermal management to get through the atmosphere to the target. Um, has to survive and has to be controllable and all of those things. So those are all areas that those transitions um, are prime for DARPA space. Yeah, we're pushing real hard on that. I thought we'd make a transition since we've been talking about space. And we've lost enough friends on that. I know. I, people, are, people are frantically <laughs> waving cards. Would you get off space, for God's sake? <clears throat> uh, I thought maybe we'd, uh, we'd talk about maritime for a few minutes. Um, <laughs> You know, we've talked about, I, I've talked about how space and maritime share some attributes, uh, small numbers of high-value assets, which are very expensive and exquisite, and we, we want to do our best to protect them, but maybe it's time, with the advent of, of the appropriate AI and autonomy, uh, to look at other opportunities. We might be able to go and look at proliferation, swarms of systems, and present a very different order of battle to the adversary than they've seen in the past. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it... It has been true for quite a while that um, surface combatants are highly vulnerable, okay? And big ocean, little ship is no longer sufficient survivable tactic. Um, and so there's been a substantial amount of work on the part of the service and on the part of industry 
to make these assets more survivable. But then they run into the same problem we run into with medicine, is do I have the right doctor or the right ship for the problem I actually have right. in the right place? And, and that's difficult. Um, and the only way we're gonna get there is not with 300 assets. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need to, to start to change that dynamic and find a way to do that. And um, like air, um, starting to move to something that is more akin to um, platforms per crew rather than crews per platform is really the only solution space for that. And then applying to those assets, um, uh, game theory, swarm, mm -hmm. um, uh, whether it be on the surface or under the surface, um, and finding the venues by which we do that uh, and control those assets in a logical way and have them where we need them or able to close where we need them in, in uh, operationally relevant timelines is, is, is where we have to get to. But, but really, I think um, getting the mindset culturally of platforms per crew rather than crews per platform is absolutely, is, is, is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. You, know, you, you kind of alluded <clears throat> to, a, to an issue which uh, I've been talking about for a little while, which is uh, it's, it's pretty clear that we're entering an era of data transparency. Uh, folks are going to see everything. Everyone's going to see everyone else. And you mentioned, uh, you know, big ship, little ocean. Well, we're, we're not, we're going to see everything that's out there. And when everyone sees that, how do you win? How do you fight in that regime where everybody has, if not perfect intelligence, they've got Google Earth real time, over the globe, how do you how do you work in that regime? Um, you know, this is a little bit of the frontier of of um, what has been dubbed artificial intelligence, um, but it is really the the joining and partnering of um, man and machine, okay, and the strengths of both applied and when you go through this kind of transition, it's really kind of the, like the, stagings, the stages of grieving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> first, you're in total denial. There's no way that stuff's going to work. That's right. And you hope not. <laughs> yeah. And then you're in the mindset of, OK, I will compete with it. So I play chess. I play Jeopardy. I do things you know, to compete with it. Um, and it's only after that that you start to think about how to partner with this type of capability. And so it's not the fact that you know that something's there. Um, it's what do you want to do about it? What kind of will are you imposing? Um, and how do you want to change the behavior? And I think, you know, for me, um, as we uh, worked in these early areas of, of artificial intelligence, um, you know, taking things like gaming and simulation, applying artificial intelligence to that, because at the end of the day, at least for the practitioner, it's, it's about predicting. It's about logical outcomes from a, from a known set of variables and how many variables can you take in and which ones matter. And so you end up as a commander with something that is akin to a um, today's version on the weather channel of, of a hurricane track. I've got predictions here that based on the bias you want to apply to them, they create an area of you know, kind of the Goldilocks solution of outliers and then the core. And, and the, the practitioner is looking at what is it I'm trying to um, influence? What do I think will have the greatest influence on what happens out there? And then picking those choices, number one. And then number two, turning the, the, um, the table around, because today, if I say, you know, you pick your AI activity, you know, um, Alexa, you know, or Google search engines, I ask it questions, okay? Part of what you have to get out of this is it gives you observations, okay? And that's, that's the key interaction. Explainable that has to occur. So I'm looking at, you know, here's how I think I'm going to go over to take the next hill. And it's going, have you thought about what's on the other side of the hill? Mm -hmm. you know, and would that change your strategy or not? Mm -hmm. so, so there's a give and take here that we have not yet developed. 
Okay, people are rushing to, it just takes off and does everything on its own. Right, but this is gonna be a teaming solution. This is a team effort. It, it will be developed as a team effort. Much of the legislation and, and uh, uh, restrictions that are being put on it is to ensure that there is an opportunity for it to be a team sport, mm -hmm. okay, um, and not to have it run off. But I, I mean, I think AI right now will be most dominant on the battlefield in standing rules of engagement, okay? I have a set of criteria that are laid out in data, metrics. When they are met, I am threatened and I have a legal right and basis by which to attack, mm -hmm. okay? And that will be a interaction between man and machine that at some point will then probably dominate by the machine. That's an, that's an interesting point. I think that was brought up yesterday during, uh, during the Mosaic Warfare discussion on the stage. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it was uh, Admiral Swift or General Perkins, but someone said, you know, commanders are going to have to get used to delegating to folks. Um, but the truth is they're going to have to get used to delegating not to people, but to manned, unmanned teams and to some extent to autonomous agents. Right. And those decisions, they're going to have to be able to trust those decisions to be made. And I think that that brings up a whole new, whole new ethos and, and attitude about how we're going to operate with these kinds of systems. I think, I think that's the case. Um, right now, I mean, my background as a pilot, you know, I have a, you know, a great feel for the machine I strap onto my back, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. But at some point, that's got to go to the 10 other machines in the idea of, of platforms per crew that are also out there with me. Right. And they have to act as one and I have to be able to interact with them. Mm -hmm. um, that's a simple, I mean, uh, that's grossly oversimplifying the transition, but we're not there yet. We have not gotten that mindset of partnering. But we need to get there. Yeah, we need to get quickly. There. Well, maybe we, uh, maybe we transition to ground. Okay. Talk a little bit about the ground. Um, so we've, we've, uh, we've discussed the idea of, uh, of ground being the most symmetric form of combat. We kind of come into it with you know, our gun pointed at the adversary and the adversary's gun pointed at us. In the urban environment, you know, we're, we're putting folks on top of uh, vehicles to draw fire because we don't know who to shoot at in, in these situations. Um, the suggestion we'd had in our office was, is there a way to, to escape that, that symmetry? Is there a way to use autonomy and AI to learn the environment to basically do battlefield prep so that I don't have to put precious folks in harm's way until we understand the scenario and perhaps uh, be able to take action. So you know, our, thought, our thought is really disrupt that battlefield by doing the kind of unmanned un man teaming where items, systems go forward, they figure out what's going to happen and then they put that information back in the hands of the commander who can then deploy the manned, unmanned teams without uh, putting folks at risk immediately. So. Um, I think that those are all elements that yeah. you will want to have. Um, but if you look at the um, history of armed conflict um, from melee, which is just basically everybody gets out there and fights with, with, with whatever's in their hands, to to mass and to maneuver. Um, each of those was put in place to solve a problem almost always of your adversary being able to get to some place you didn't want them or surprise you. Um, but the advances were always made at, uh, on the backs of um, communication breakthroughs, the radio, et cetera, for maneuver, and <coughs> on um, uh, knowledge intelligence, um, uh, predictive capability of what's going to happen. And so with the advent of, of computational power at the edge that we have the opportunity today and the knowledge that we can store in data that we can mine very quickly and bring to the, to the fire control to the battlefield, um, this transition of we will still do, uh, you're, you're there and I'm here and we're going to go at each other and we're going to do mass and we're going to do maneuver, but swarm is really going to start to dominate the battlefield. And the question is, how do I get the swarm there mm -hmm. quickly so that it's relevant? How do I show the, 
both the capability and the willingness to use in, in a deterrent scheme to prevent. Mm -hmm. um, and then how much of this can be done um, left a boom, such that we don't get to the kinetic side of the equation? Um, and how do, what does that look like? And how do we deploy that ahead of the problem um, to influence the outcome? And then understanding that the outcome has to get back to a, a um, diplomatic solution because just killing everything is not go has never won a war. And we've got a lot of battle scars around to prove that. killing everything but not winning the wars. And so we've got to start to figure out how we make those transitions in a more integrated way in government. Um, and then how do we sustain it and be in the right place at the right time with the right tools? Um, all of those are, are areas that the ground combatant um, has to now get the capabilities for. We have to bring those capabilities to the field. And so I'll go back to the, the space activity. I mean, um, one of the things that I think you'll hear from Shotwell, which I think is astounding statistic and probably wrong, but if I can get you to the other side of the earth in 40 minutes for a business class ticket price, now I'm talking about pounds or people that we can put in places um, with capabilities um, that the ground combatant heretofore really didn't dream of, yeah. okay, and didn't have. <clears throat> Fires for ground combatants today stop at the 499 mile mark. That just can't be. We've got to take long range precision fires and get it for the ground combatant and get them out in front of them such that little green men on a border can't do what they did. Islands don't worry us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, supply lines are not the problem anymore. Um, we have to change that dynamic and um, integration of those domains. You know, the new buzzword is cross domain. It used to be called combined arms. You know, um, and so uh, we just have to figure out how we're going to do that. And that's not as much a service problem as it is a, as a combatant command problem mm -hmm. and how we're going to start to think about those problems. But the ground is the <coughs> most ripe, I think you're exactly right, the ground is the most ripe for advancement in these areas and giving them a new toolbox that is so disruptive that it will give anybody pause. And that's an, <coughs> that's an excellent point. <coughs> we, uh, we've been looking inside the office at some uh, some opportunities to go off and provide that over 499 kilometer capability to the ground element so that they don't have to don't have to be tripwires in certain activities they can actually be standoff and, mm -hmm. and still get the job done so hypersonics will be a piece of that the third party targeting aspects of space will be a piece of that but I think you're right it's going to be very disruptive for the ground elements it's going to be very interesting to see where that goes yeah and and we just can't get the fires there in 20 minutes we've got to get the people there in 20 minutes right. and that's that's a big big lift, but most of the R&D is being done by the commercial sector. Right. And they want to move people. Yeah, and they want to move. And cargo. Yeah. Um, and so. I'm showing we have about eight minutes left. Um, <laughs> maybe we should talk a little bit about the air domain uh, to, to sort of wrap and, uh, and then see where we go. I'm not sure we'll have time for questions or not, uh, but oh. that's probably fine. We can, we can talk to folks afterwards if they have questions. So. Um. <clears throat> I think more than anything, the um, transition to oh, cruise um, per platform is a, is a transition that culturally is occurring in the Air Force, <clears throat> is difficult, but is occurring. Um, but then we've got to start to think about um, how we get long-range strategic fires to the other side of the Earth when we can't have basing rights, we can't um, rely on that. Um, and even if you want to think about hypersonics, hypersonics around the globe in the atmosphere is, is a, a hugely heavy lift. Um, and so um, if you're looking to put fires you know, um, on the other side of the earth, um, you know, and we're only going to do um, reach that gets to the other side of the earth with nuclear weapons, um, we really are disadvantaging ourselves. 
number one in, in the reach and the speed and the survivability and the penetration capabilities, but two in the, in the mass and the volume. Um, you have to be able to do this at scale. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're going to stay with uh, solid boosters that live in the ground for 50 years, um, <laughs> we're, you know, if that's what we're going to build as our next deterrent, yeah. I'm really concerned. Yeah, I understand. We've been, we've been looking at... Uh, that should be a yeah. part of this. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've been looking at, um, at stealth as something we've been, we've been spending a great deal of time perfecting for decades, and I, and I think there's still room for it. But I'm very concerned that we've been using it as sort of the, you know, the key arrow in our quiver, and folks get it. Um, they've gotten it for some time, and they've developed necessary countermeasures. And so we've been suggesting, hey, um, we have to figure out how to try something else at this stage. We have to be able to, to go orthogonal and confuse the enemy here. Uh, stealth is probably not that in the future. Uh, um. The, the advent of stealth and the work that we did in stealth was good for a period of time, and it's not something we're going to stop doing. No, we won't discard it. Like. But we heretofore, ahead of stealth, it was speed. Mm -hmm. We're kind of back to speed now. Okay? But the reality here in the air domain is that the limiting <clears throat> factor is not stealth, it's not survivability, it's not speed, it's the person. I mean, if, if I've got to limit it to seven or eight or nine Gs um, and acceleration rates and things like that and turn rates, et cetera, and delivery. We can't make jelly out of our pilots. Right? And nine hours, I mean, the human is the diminishing return here. And we've got to start to understand that. And it doesn't mean that we eliminate the human. It's just that the role of the human has to change. may f fundamentally have to change in order to have the dominance that we want to have in the air domain. And we've turned air, or we have had air, as almost a sanctuary. Um, and that's just not going to persist. Um, and the problem with stealth, the challenge with stealth, is that, um, as you highlighted, if it takes you 15 years to get it to the fleet, um, and it only takes me an algorithm and a new board at Moore's Law, mm -hmm. um, we have a the problem. Perishability <laughs> is there. It still imposes cost, but it's still. But it's low cost. Huh? It's yeah, it's hard. I think that's fair. I think we're probably at a point where maybe we uh, maybe we do try to take a question or two. What do you think? All right. I think I've got them in here. Right? <laughs> All right. Let's see. Well, let's see. I kind of like this one. <laughs> Maybe a bit of a softball, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, a lot of senior leaders are starting to echo the mantra of going faster and emphasizing speed and developing capability. Uh, what does it mean to go faster but not take on undue additional technical risk? How do we do this without getting ourselves in trouble, I think is what the author is trying to ask. Um, if you're going to build sophisticated platforms that have a reasonable opportunity to survive, but are going to go against a smart adversary, um, you're, going to, you're going to lose platforms, number one. Uh, number two, if you um, uh, have an expectation here that the cost of those platforms and the time to market has to be more agile and responsive to the realities of the battlefield. So in the case of the F-35, you're trying to project 20 years into the future to the conflict you're going to have. And the only thing you're sure of is that you'll be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'll put it on yeah. the back of a person to, <laughs> to adapt the platform to the realities of the world. Okay? And that's not going to serve us well. Um, so uh, you really need to start to think about um, platforms that are trucks that are built for the domain and the uh, maneuver that you want to do in that domain and that the rest of the platform is built to stay well ahead of Moore's law. Um, uh, you know, with any number of techniques today, you talk with cars over the air, um, updates, et cetera, sure. but we need to be able to build and update not at the speed of manufacturing, but at the speed of 
of um, really the software engineering, the algorithm start, the, the, the learning, the deep learning neural nets mm -hmm. and whatnot, take advantage of that. And that's a fundamentally different architecture than we have today. Um, one, it's data intensive. Today, if you build a fighter plane, it only wants to know the exact smallest amount of information necessary to be successful in employing a weapon. And everything else is thrown away in, in the name of latency and mm -hmm. precision. You have to change that. We have to change that. And so um, I'm, I'm, uh, I have the scar tissue of 40 years of changing, changing tap chapters to tabs and tabs to chapters in the name of better acquisition, okay, <laughs> and faster. Um, you know, and I think uh, General Pace had, had it right. I just need to teach you how to sleep faster. You know, um, that's the only thing that's going to change. The, you know, these are tough platforms to build. The question is, how do you keep them agile and relevant on the battlefield? Mm -hmm. Not how do you, how fast do you build them? Number one, and then number two, can I, in fact, start to proliferate these platforms at scale so I can drive the cost down? Right. Um, and and move them into a um, combination of autonomy and robotics and whatnot onto the battlefield with me. I feel like um, if you get to the point where you can proliferate this way, yeah. um, you're, you're going to drive not just the cost but the risk aversion out mm -hmm. so that folks go, you know, I don't, I don't have to spend the next two or three years in test on this. I need to prototype it, figure out if it works, yeah. and then we'll start going and we'll make lots of them. And we won't care if we lose a few. Right. We're just gonna I, mean, go, I, we're just gonna uh, I guess I can't say a brand name here, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I get in my car in this morning, I go, oh my goodness, it actually goes faster. I got an update last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, or it was really crappy in the rain. Now it's good in the rain. If I can make those changes, um, you know, to adapt to the battlefield, that's, that's where I think we have the opportunity to to not only pace the fight, but to get ahead of it and disrupt it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see here. These are the secret questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's an interesting one. Um, there's been a lot of buzz about DOD leveraging commercial approaches. If the DOD continues to rely on commercial, are we putting ourselves at risk when these business cases don't close, companies might go out of business, decide they don't want to do the job? What do you think? Should we rely on them? Uh, oh, those communists in the commercial those, sector. Those evil yeah. okay. commercial people. <laughs> <laughs> Can we trust them? <laughs> if, if I had a problem with somebody appearing on the flank as the J-8 or the vice chairman, um, the first place I went was to commercial industry, sp specifically small business, because the risk calculus is fundamentally different. I mean, I rely on the big companies for certain things. I rely on the small companies for other things. The, the question is not whether or not somebody will decide not to do business with a government. Um, the question here is, um, is, quite frankly, is can you keep this, the incentive structure aligned in such a way that you get what you need and that the opportunity to do that is broad, against a broad enough base? And over the past 20 years, we have shrunk that base down to one, per, you know, one company that builds rockets, one company that builds the fuel for the rocket. I mean, all of these vulnerabilities that we have, we did that to ourselves. We did. Okay. We I'm asked not for it. We asked the, for it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not worried about the commercial sector. I'm worried about government doing that to us. I mean, at, at the end of the day, we're the ones that cause those kind of problems. And so, yes, there will be times when... Um, the academic world or a certain sector will find doing business with a government is not politically aligned with where they want to be, okay? But at the end of the day, you can find people who want to make money and will do the business. That's, I'm not worried about that side of the equation. I'm, I'm more worried about um, trying to ensure that um, we, we lead turn building the workforce to do this comp competitive edge work, number one. And number two, the bigger problem is we don't leave behind a generation in building that force. Um, and, and, and we've got to find an educational construct that does not stop after 
X number of years and a master's degree or whatever, but is there for the workforce and, and in combination with the workforce, uh, including the government workforce, to educate the workforce and not leave a generation behind every time we do a disruptive technology. How do you do that? I mean, it's too expensive for the workforce to have that imposed on them. It's too expensive on the government. But we have to find a, a combination of government, academia, and, the, and business world, particularly manufacturing, to support these transitions which are coming ever faster and are, are more often than not leaving at least one, if not two, generations behind. That, to me, is where the partnership really could break down. Trying to get folks to operate at machine speed. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. For me, um, I mean, I tell this story a lot, but when we moved to the F-18, I was in the class desk, which is the engineering side of, of Naval Air Systems Command um, in the development and doing that. And it was, um, you know, who do you turn to to go fly a new airplane? A guy who's flown airplanes forever, okay? So he flies it. I flew it like an F-4, okay? Because that's what you knew. Yeah, because until we got Hornet babies, yeah. we didn't really know what the airplane could do, right. number one. Number two, we lied to the pilots and told them the stick was connected to the airplane. It's not connected to the airplane. <laughs> you know? But fly-by-wire was just, that was, that was so terrible an idea that we couldn't advertise it for seven years. We, we know opt most of the software. You're not really in control. Yeah, you're, you're not really controlling the airplane. It, you're just voting. Yeah. <laughs> which, which sounds like a harbinger for the kind of discussion yeah, we're I having mean, now. The, in, the machine is deciding how to get where you want it to go. That's all the stick is telling you. We're, we're, you know, machine. I really want to go over here. Yeah, I'll tell you what controls you use. <laughs> but that's true, you know, and, and the cultural side of that is difficult. And, and that transition in the military historically has been a three generation transition. Put a new system in the field, it's three generations before you actually have somebody using that system as it was designed to be used and envisioned to be used. You're right, we have to do better than that. We have to do better than that. And we can't leave the manufacturing force behind. We have to carry that with us. That's the risk. That's a great point because the implication is that no matter what you do with your tool set, if you can't get folks to figure out how to use them, yeah. you end up with the same latency problem and you're still behind your adversary. And if you expect a 40-year-old pilot to figure out how to use a new airplane, you're dreaming. <laughs> I mean, the habit patterns are just not there. Yeah. I think we're, uh, you're saying five minutes. Does that mean we have five minutes? Okay, just <laughs> to make sure. Because I'm seeing different things off this clock. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> all right, let's see what else we've got. Um, ah, all right, let's try this. Artificial intelligence, hypersonics, and swarms are also capabilities that adversaries are investing in. <clears throat> so what should we be doing in terms of defensive capability against these kinds of things? <clears throat> Excuse me. Probably talking to the wrong guy on this stuff, but... Um, uh, my, my background would, would say, number one, I'm not worried about defense, I'm going to kill you first. <laughs> um, yeah. And that, my, at the, that the advantage will be with the killer, and I don't go onto the battlefield not expecting that I'm going to come home. I mean, I, you know, that there is a uh, finality here and a risk calculus that um, we may wish away, but will never go away, okay? Um, and so I'd rather have sending, you know, being asked to send somebody into conflict, I'd rather have them going in in an offensive mindset um, with defense being, okay, just how fast can I run? Right. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so, yes, other people will have swarms. Yes, other people will have artificial intelligence. Yes, I will build. We know they'll have hypersonics. <laughs> yeah, they'll have hypersonics. They all have all of those things already. I don't not go on the battlefield because the other guy has a gun. Right. Okay, I go on the battlefield because the other guy has a gun. <laughs> okay. And so um, that, that side of it, yes, there should be a defensive mindset. But what's the investment? Yeah, but it will be more, I would term it more as resilience, not defense. Mm -hmm. um, I can operate through that environment, um, number one. And number two, I can use that environment it, um, to come at you not in kind. Mm 
mm -hmm. um, which is the cross-domain activities, et cetera, combined arms. But if you're going to come at me with you know, overwhelming force on the sea, um, I'm going to apply to you, as people have done to us, um, capabilities that will take away the sea as a, as, as a sanctuary for you. Um, and so it is not a thought of what do I do to defend AI, it is a thought of how do I proliferate this across domains, across um, the spectrum, and, and maneuver in both the spectrum and in time mm -hmm. um, to outmaneuver you in that domain. I think that's a fair point. I, I look at a question like this and I think, I'm good with defensive capability, uh, but is it imposing cost on the adversary? Yeah. Is it actually costing the adversary enough that they are deterred from acting? And if so, then the defensive capability is probably worth it. And I'm, in this case, I'm specifically thinking of missile defense, but there's a game theory aspect to this where I want to complicate the adversary's calculus and make right. them not want to take the shot. And so I yeah. might want to have some sort of defensive capability just to do that, as long as I'm not expending all my treasure to go get it. But my, def my definition of a defensive capability is an assured second strike. Yeah. Okay. No matter what you do to me, I'm, I'm going, going to, to get you. Yeah. Yeah. You're dying either way. Yeah. And you're not going to know how it's going to come right. or when. I'll pick that. I like that. <laughs> all right. I think we can probably That's a call happy it note. <laughs> <laughs> happy note. <laughs> We, we end up victorious, though. That can't be that. <laughs> well, I think on that note, we're probably good. Uh, sir, I really appreciate you coming in, and I'm glad we could have the discussion today. And I want to thank everybody for listening and participating, and, uh, and thanks to the folks who asked the questions as well. So, General Harry, thank you. Thank you.